welcome to the second European Restraint Reduction Network Conference. We have ahead of us a packed two days. I think it's going to be fascinating and thought-provoking. And if the values of the organisation are right and the strong leadership, then I think it's harder for abusive practices to flourish. People won't confront the issue of fear or aggression often. They'll change the language on you. 86% of sentenced male prisoners have got a history of mental ill health. So what does that tell us? The police are being called too often to mental health units. It's about data-informed practice, isn't it? We've got to start interrogating why this is happening more frequently. We can basically take away people's civil rights for no reason other than we decide we want to do that. And that is an incredible... The biggest achievement this year has really been bringing together people from different organisations, from different sectors, from health, social care and education, and really finding out that we have so many things in common and so much good practice that could be shared. What we're talking about today is fundamentally enshrined in human rights law. If we have to have restraint, it must be the least restrictive possible. It's been fascinating hearing these different perspectives from around the UK and from around the world. It's just meeting people from different environments and how basically we're all singing from the same hymn sheet all with the intention of uh, reducing restraints. But really for me, implementing a restraint reduction programme in an organisation, it's really refreshing to see other professionals in the same position and share ideas and kind of gauge where you're at. How often does it happen that you've trialled something once and it didn't work and then teams say, well, we must never do that again? A lot of the speakers are national health, mental health, and we're a private residential and we're only a very small group um, but I think some of the tools and some of the things they're putting out there can be modified to suit ours as well. It's been brilliant again this year. Um, highlights for me, uh, Kevin Ann Hookshawn, Six Core Strategies. We immediately respond when we see someone start to escalate. We don't sit around in the nursing station and wait till you hear the first punch. The unexpected highlight for me was probably Isabel Latham's workshop. Hearing evidence about how workplace cultures develop. But as soon as one or other of those elements starts to fall down, you break that cycle. You need to do something about all of the components at the same time, even if it's a little thing, rather than just thinking we'll focus on workforce development or we'll focus on policies and procedures. Also, Michael Nuno in his workshop, again, really helpful, so really interactive. Any good trainer is going to be challenged by training the bosses. I went to a sit and see workshop with Lynn Fair, which was really, really interesting and something that I'm definitely going to try and take back to my service. The action is only as good as the energy and the compassion that goes alongside it. It was the ability to pick up on the tiny things that can make a real difference in someone's life and how we demonstrate care and compassion to the people that we work with. How do you see those tiny things that's going on in your care setting every day? That means people feel cared for, so therefore they feel safe. A few of the key points that I'm going to take away will be largely based around the six core strategies. I think I'm really interested in making sure that we see things from our own staff point of view and how you get the message across to your staff that you need to change a culture for restraint reduction. Iris was fantastic uh, and Kevin as well. Uh, I found them really inspiring and I felt the way that we want to move is what they were talking about. You know, you're saying don't restrain. No, we're not saying don't restrain. It's in the title, no force first. The experience that Iris shared with us, it gave me the insight of on where we are with reducing it to restrictive interventions. She has given me some very, very valuable first-hand information on how we ignorantly maybe treat our patients without taking consideration of their experience. There's lots of innovation, there's lots of things we can do. And I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, why is lived experience so important? It's vital to what we do. Because if we don't hear people's experiences, how can we know how to look after them? You as stakeholders are so important in contributing and developing policy and guidance and changing law. There was a lot of new legislation, new guidance coming out from various departments last year. A lot of publicity in the media following the mind reports. I think this year we are actually at a quite a seminal moment 
we really are in a position where we can take off and bring together good practice and start spreading the word and getting the network to do its job. Clearly there are challenges ahead in terms of turning the conversations that have been happening here into practice on the ground. But if the evidence that's been presented at the conference stands up to scrutiny, then that could mean really changing and improving the lives of many people who need support and need care. I suppose what I'm taking away from this is all of you guys. The passion, the interest, the sharing, the readiness to move forward and to learn from each other and to go on this journey with us is the most impressive thing to me. How can staff understand how it feels when you're restrained if someone can't tell them? There's lots of ways of restraining people and we've heard loads of that. You know, simple things that you, you, you wouldn't think were restrained but actually are stopping someone having a quality of life.